way I can disappear and I leave you alone. <laughs> Hello? Good afternoon, everybody. After a very intense morning, I have now the honor to introduce you to Father Martin Mayer. Father Martin Mayer has been recently appointed the spiritual advisory role of UNIAPAC. And I would like him to bless this meeting or this afternoon and to tell us a little bit about himself. And that's going to be a very brief interruption of our agenda. So, Father Martin, welcome to UNIAPAC. Welcome to Lisbon. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Rolando, for this uh, warm welcome. My apologies for being late. I flew in from Brussels. I am uh, working actually in Brussels in the Jesuit European Social Center. And uh, I feel honored and uh, challenged uh, uh, to be uh, uh, called to be uh, the new spiritual advisor of Unia Pack. Uh, I know that uh, I had a great predecessor, Father Edouard Ayer, many of you may remember. <laughs> and I just want to remember him saying that uh, he was a Jesuit who made me happy to be a Jesuit. And uh, uh, that's how I uh, remember Edouard. Mm. Uh, you uh, have your World Congress uh, about uh, uh, business as a noble vocation, uh, and I think every human being has a vocation. I felt 40 years ago the vocation to become a Jesuit because I wanted to commit myself uh, uh, in following Jesus to make this world a bit more just and a bit more human. Uh, the Jesuits uh, uh, defined their mission in today's world after the Vatican Council in the short formula to uh, commit for faith and justice. And I think this also brings us together here. Uh, donc, je vous remercie beaucoup uh, de m'accueillir et uh, peut-être je vais uh, continuer en français uh, et uh, prier le Seigneur uh, uh, qu'il nous envoie son esprit uh, pour uh, nos réflexions uh, que nous allons faire ensemble. Père très bon, tu es un ami uh, des hommes, tu es un ami de la vie et uh, tu veux que tous et toutes uh, vivons, nous vivons dans uh, des circonstances uh, uh, dignes et uh, nous te prions que uh, tu nous inspires uh, dans notre recherche commune de faire une contribution, euh, d'humaniser ce monde et de le faire dans l'esprit de ton Fils, Jésus-Christ, et nous te demandons de nous bénir dans ce cheminement au nom du Père et du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. Amen. Nous allons donner l'initiative au troisième panel. Queria só relembrar o aviso que tinha feito há bocado, que todos aqueles que estão registados para irem à Prevenção a Fátima amanhã, que passem pelo Secretariado para confirmar essa inscrição. Então, dou a palavra ao Christoph Stuckenberg, que nos vai orientar e moderar este painel. Good afternoon. Uh, D'abord, je remercie beaucoup uh, le Père uh, spirituel, si on peut dire, le nouveau Père spirituel de l'Uniapac pour uh, cette bénédiction et cette prière. Um, <coughs> yes, I welcome everybody for this afternoon session. I suggest before we start, and we are, it's a difficult period in digesting uh, excellent uh, lunch, <laughs> turn to your right to your left side, and those at the end turn to God, uh, <laughs> and just make this exercise for one minute. Show you, just give me the hand. Mm -hmm. So just this, to <laughs> reactivate your energy, huh? <laughs> one minute. One minute. One minute, Salah. <laughs> 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 with your neighbors. Very good. 
We be here. <laughs> Look at that. No, do 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 it him. No. <laughs> Yeah, let's try. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. With love, with love. <laughs> so, I hope the energy is back. <laughs> Not bad. The <laughs> afternoon panel is about inspiring principle led business performance. We had uh, this morning, or uh, the, the panel on introducing. Uh, uh, the personal transformation with very uh, profound uh, testimonials. We had a second panel on inclusivity, uh, inclusiveness, and now we have this third panel on inspiring principle-led of values-driven business performance. We could say we have power-driven, we have money-driven, we have factor-driven, we heard this morning, we have principle-driven, we have values-driven. So what is the driving uh, last criteria for our decisions? That's the topic. If it's values driven, what are the values and how do we deal with it? We all know that uh, this beautiful slogan, uh, business as a noble vocation, really a great title of the Pope and of the publication. Uh, but we also heard this morning business can be a painful vocation, can be uh, even a risky vocation. So how to stick to the values that we have and we want to promote in difficult and in less difficult times? That's the topic of this afternoon. And I'm happy to introduce Richard, who is a friend, but more important, since 30 years, he runs faith in business in Cambridge, which is committed to our common cause. So we see we have Catholic, we have Anglican, we have Protestant, we have Pentecostals, we have an ecumenical also spirit inside Uniapak, and you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Christoph. I was attracted to this conference by the title Business as a no Noble Vacation. Many people, of course, think of business as anything other than a noble vacation, but I have a deep belief that it is or can be. And I suspect every country has its business heroes and heroines. In the UK, we have a noble heritage of Christian business people that are often referred to. Interestingly, most of them are neither Roman Catholic, like most of you, nor Anglican, like me, but nonconformists, that is, Protestant Christians who broke away from the established church after it had broken away from the Catholic church. And the nonconformist group that has wielded the most influence in British business history is a small group you may or may not have heard of called the Quakers. Founded in the mid 17th century, they practiced simple services of worship where they listened silently to God and then shared their experiences. They were a small group. There were never more than about 20,000 of them, but they wielded a huge influence on British business. So many of the early UK banks were Quaker, notably Lloyd's and Barclays, who are two of the four big banks in the UK today. The pictures you can see are of Samson Lloyd, founder of Lloyd's, and that's a picture of the Barclays headquarters building, which goes back to the 19th century. They practiced banking in a sober and responsible way. Their emphases were keeping people's money safe, providing business with capital, managing the element of risk, and embodying prudence and moderation, qualities rather different from those that were characteristic of the banking sector in the events leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. But they were also prominent in many other areas of business. By the 19th century, they were into shoes, confectionery, Three of the great chocolate makers were Quaker, drinks, engineering, 
soap, pharmaceuticals, and textiles. In the 19th century, following the Industrial Revolution, there were many employers who treated their workforce harshly, harshly and had a very ruthless style of operating. They were anything but principle-led, you might say. But there was a significant group of employers who were different. These nonconformist entrepreneurs who included Quakers but other types of Protestants as well. They practiced high standards of business ethics. They were successful innovators, such as George Cadbury, who was the first to make pure cocoa without any additives. They relocated factories away from highly polluted city centers. They were humane employers. Some rehoused workers in suburbs or villages, such as Cadbury in the Bourneville area of Birmingham. They were strongly motivated by their faith and they were generous in giving much of their wealth away. They were philanthropists. Many of them founded trusts and foundations. Now, that's all very well as a matter of history, you may say. Are there any such Christian entrepreneurs in the UK today? Well, the organization that I run, Faith in Business, did some research to try and find out. For the last five years, we've run an entrepreneurship project. And the leading figure in this, and the main researcher, is Kina Robertshaw, who's a remarkable woman from Africa, who in her 20s was a leading businesswoman in Zambia. She then came to the UK and studied theology, and over a two-year period interviewed 50 Christian entrepreneurs, who represented a mixture of people at different personal stages, near the end of their careers, mid-career or starting out, different sized companies, anything from one employee to a thousand, different business sectors, cars, construction, consultancy, chemicals and many others, different ethnic backgrounds, church backgrounds, both men and women. And Keener explored with them the entrepreneur's motivation, their values and the impact of their faith on their work. And the outcome of the research was a book that is jointly authored by Kina and me. It's called A Voice to be Heard. It contains lots of inspiring stories. And I brought several copies, so if you're interested in reading it, do come and see me, and I'm very happy to sell you one. Now, in the course of the interviews, there were some words that kept coming up over again. And in the book, we've clustered these into twin themes, words or qualities that belonged together. So there are chapters on calling or vacation and kingdom, vision and passion, creativity and courage, relationships and service, stewardship and power, integrity and honesty, <coughs> prayer and fasting, important that, perseverance and hope. One of Keener's questions was, do you feel your business is contributing to the advance of God's kingdom? That made them stop and think. And interestingly, they all answered yes. That wasn't true of many of the questions, but they all answered yes to that one. However, they understood and interpreted this in different ways. So for some, advancing God's kingdom was about making the world a better place through the provision of the go goods and services that the company churned out. They were proud of what they made and did, and they felt it enhanced the quality of life. There were a second group who saw it as more about embodying Christian values and practicing high standards of business ethics. And these were the ones who taught the language of principles and values. I'll say more about that in a moment. There was a third group for whom it was more about witnessing by word, gossiping the gospel, you might say. They were very keen to share their faith with employees, customers, and business partners. And then there was a fourth group for whom it was more about what they did with their money. They were into charitable giving to worthy causes. They were notable for their personal and corporate generosity. It was interesting, I think, that most of them only mentioned one of those four. We would like to have seen more of them mentioning uh, more than one, and that's something we suggest 
in the book a more inclusive and integrated approach <laughs> that combines all four because we think they're all important. But let me focus on the second group who answered the kingdom of God question in, that, uh, uh, in terms of embodying Christian values and practicing high standards of business ethics. These were employers who explicitly set out their business principles and values. And I'm going to focus on two. First of all, Simon Lawson. He's chairman of Lawson's, which is a family business founded in 1921. It's the largest independent timber building materials and fencing business in the southeast of England, employing 750 people. Lawson's strapline is family values, professional service. And its mission statement is to make work as interesting and satisfying as possible, which indicates a strong focus on employee welfare. Simon is a man whose most striking quality is humility. What marks him out as a Christian employer is an acknowledgement that all his success is due to God. He takes great inspiration from the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And he follows that in a distinctive way by inviting groups of his employees to his home for lunch. Now what's unusual is that Simon doesn't get a caterer in to provide the meal. He doesn't ask his wife to make the meal because sadly his marriage broke up a few years ago. But he asks his employees what they'd like to eat and he cooks the meal himself. He literally serves them. Fortunately, he happens to be a good cook. <laughs> and over the meal, they often have conversations at a very deep level. Simon being honest about some of the problems that he's faced and overcome. And very often the conversations end up about values, about personal values, about corporate values, so that they've come to be known as values lunches. Here's a second example from the book, Valerie King, who is in fact Roman Catholic. She's managing director of Rooflight, a company which makes windows that fit into roofs. Hers is a smaller company. She employs 75 people. Under her guidance, Rooflight has articulated a clear and straightforward set of values, integrity, care, empowerment, and unity. Now those values might seem a bit broad, they might seem a bit vague, but they're actually spelt out in terms of specific behaviours. So there are three types of action that are uh, indicated for each of those four values. And if anyone fails to live and work by these values, they are made accountable. So how they're doing on the value score is part of their regular people's regular staff appraisal. And that means that they're taken extremely seriously. Now, on the basis of what I've observed in Lawson's, Rooflight, and many other companies, I would say that to be effective, values need to be the following. First of all, they need to be authentic, genuine, not just nice words, that make a company look good. They need to be exemplified by the leader. The leader needs to walk the talk. I like what um, Stefano Zamani said last night about intrinsically motivated leaders. That's what you need for values to really cut some edge in a company. Then thirdly, they need to be owned, by which I mean accepted and lived out by the whole workforce. There needs to be a consistent message coming through <coughs> from the company in its entirety. And for that to happen, they need to be regularly discussed, taught, and enforced. They need to be applied to all stakeholders. There are some companies that are very good about the way they treat certain stakeholders, most often their customers and maybe their employees, but seem to have blind spots with regard to others. Some of our leading British supermarkets, for instance, are notorious for what we call screwing the suppliers. 
giving their suppliers a very hard deal, paying them late, uh, and so on. And then all this needs to be set in the context of a sound business model. This last point is very important, but it's often ignored. And I want to end by uh, giving you a bad example, not from our 50 Christian entrepreneurs, but one that hit the headlines in our national news this year. I wonder how many of you have heard of Carillion. Carillion was a huge UK construction company which collapsed with £7 billion liabilities in February, causing the collapse of many smaller supplier companies that were dependent on it. Carillion had an excellent value statement, which you can still find on the internet. It's rather funny in a way, but nobody has bothered to take it down. Their value statement emphasizes openness, collaboration, mutual dependency, working closely with suppliers, professional delivery. All excellent values and ones that were notable by their absence <coughs> in the way that the company operated when the going got tough. Now you could explain this by saying that Carillion was run by leaders who are hypocritical people who didn't really believe in the values they expressed. That may be true, but I suspect the reality is more subtle than that. Carillion's values were undermined by the fact that its fundamental business model was unsound. It kept winning contracts by bidding at a lower price than its competitors. But this price was usually unrealistic. The company just couldn't deliver the projects on time at the prices agreed. So it kept losing money on the projects. It was motivated by what you could call a relentless dash for cash, but this meant it kept bidding for contracts at prices it couldn't deliver. And often the UK government was at fault in this. The government awarded Carillion many important projects, particularly in the public sector, building hospitals and schools, because it judged different bids simply on the basis of lowest price. But that is an unsound business model. So there's a lesson here. You can have wonderful corporate values, but still come unstuck if you're unable to deliver a product or service that people want efficiently and at a realistic price. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Hickinson, for this uh, insight in history, in examples, 50 examples you published, uh, which join the examples we heard also this morning, uh, uh, that we show we have a lot of very positive examples, but you show also <coughs> how tricky it can be to have good values, which does not include the performance part, which is in the title of this panel this afternoon. So economic performance is part of the values that must be reconciled. And we are very keen now to hear from the panelists short five minutes examples, and then we will try to come into dialogue, because we don't want to have just four speeches. We want really to have a dialogue. And we heard here as the first, um, Alejandro Pelicho from Mexico. Thank you very much. Wow. Good afternoon. We are going to switch a little bit to Spanish. The Spanish hasn't been heard yet. <laughs> so I don't want you to miss the wonderful opportunity to hear it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I set up some <coughs> slides, please. ¿Cómo hacemos una gestión eh, que a partir de los principios ponga a la persona en el centro? Eh, el contexto nos dice que eh, esta frase que se ha vuelto doctrina del señor Adam Smith eh, nos dice que solo actuamos por nuestro propio interés y nos dice que la mano mágica del mercado que está suficientemente descontada arreglará lo demás. Los cristianos sabemos que eso no es así, que tenemos que hacernos cargo los unos de los otros. Eh, cuando esto se ha llevado a la empresa en términos de estrategia 
y pensamos lo que queremos lograr en el futuro y cómo lo queremos lograr, eh, esta doctrina se ha internalizado en lo que eh, como modelo de gestión se conoce más puramente como el Balance Scorecard. Eh, lo crearon dos doctores de, de la Universidad de Harvard que son brillantes y lo que nos muestra es esa lógica de causa y efecto en la cual gestionamos en las empresas. De tal suerte que llegamos en la parte de arriba eh, a buscar el beneficio financiero como la causa final de nuestro actuar. Eh, en este mismo modelo, cuando revisamos qué lugar en, eh, ocupan las personas, nos damos cuenta de que los accionistas se interesan porque son los dueños del capital, que los clientes se interesan porque son consumidores y que los colaboradores a los que llamamos empleados, como si fuera algo que empleáramos, que utilizáramos, eh, son medios para entregar eh, valor de cara a la maximización de utilidades. De tal suerte que si solo hacemos una gestión con esta lógica, hemos instrumentalizado al ser humano al servicio de la maximización de utilidades. Y entonces, cuando una persona va a trabajar con nosotros, se pregunta si lo que quiere lograr en el futuro está en sintonía con lo que quiere lograr la empresa. Y ahí muchas veces viene la frustración. Eh, sabemos que todos queremos ser felices eh, y los cristianos sabemos que solamente podemos ser felices si nos entregamos a los demás. Eh, hay un ensayo maravilloso del Cardenal Ratzinger eh, que explica, se llama Verdad y Libertad, que explica nuestro ser desde, con y para los demás. Y ahí es donde encuentra uno la felicidad y todos lo sabemos. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos una gestión que ponga al centro a la persona a partir de estos principios? Y la doctrina social de la iglesia nos da la pauta. Eh, creemos que hay una lógica de causalidad en la doctrina social de la iglesia eh, que nos ayuda a poner esto en orden. Primero hay que buscar e identificar de lo que hemos hablado aquí, esa vocación específica del líder empresarial y también de la empresa. En la medida en que esto se comparte, la comunidad va a trabajar con ese mismo propósito. Eh, ¿Cómo se alcanza eh, esta vocación? Pues primero contribuyendo al bien común externo en este sentido de salida del que nos habla el Papa Francisco, ver a la empresa como esa comunidad de salida que va en búsqueda de los demás, los clientes, pero también el resto de los eh, eh, stakeholders. Eh, y solamente se contribuye al bien común externo si antes se contribuye y se construye bien común dentro de la empresa. Eh, el bien común interno tiene que ver con actualizar la dignidad de las personas, eh, hacer que el otro se sienta apreciado en cada interacción y tiene que ver con honrar el destino universal de los bienes. Al mismo tiempo, crear valor y este, generar, eh, actualizar la dignidad de la persona sin un trade-off. ¿Cómo logramos esto? A partir de la solidaridad y la subsidiariedad. Eh, y solamente podemos ser solidarios y subsidiarios si hemos desarrollado todas las potencialidades de la persona. Cuando lo leemos hacia arriba, respondemos el para qué, eh, y el para qué tiene que ver desarrollar al ser humano en su integralidad, en todas sus dimensiones, para que aprenda a ser solidario y subsidiario. Si es solidario y subsidiario, actualizará la dignidad de sus colaboradores en la interacción, y con esto contribuirá al bien común y nos acercará cada vez más al propósito. Dos minutos más. Eh, estas son las causas, estos son los efectos, pero en la realidad podemos ver estos dos modelos separados, pero en la realidad existen al mismo tiempo. El bienestar que gestionamos con el Balance Scorecard, ya sea que lo tengamos o no, eh, y el tratar de tener una gestión basada en principios, ocurren como ustedes siempre, saben siempre al mismo tiempo. El reto es ponerlos en una perspectiva de bien común, que esa sea la causa final, porque ahí es donde encontramos la más alta vocación de líder empresarial. Entonces hay que tener esa visión de ganar, de crecer el negocio, pero hay que tener una vocación y un propósito gestionados como una misma realidad. Hay que eh, generar valor económico, todo el que se pueda, pero ponerlo junto con el destino universal de los bienes, gestionado como una sola realidad, al servicio del bien común externo. Hay que entregar valor al cliente, como lo hemos prometido, pero hay que actualizar su dignidad, la del cliente y la de todas las personas con las que interactuamos, gestionándolo como una sola realidad. Hay que ser muy buenos en la cadena de valor, en lo que es propio de nuestra industria, y hay que ser solidarios y subsidiarios en esa entrega, gestionándolo como una sola realidad. Hay que darle a la gente lo que necesita para hacer bien su trabajo, pero también lo que necesita para ser mejor persona, gestionándolo como una sola realidad. Hay que tener esa estructura que nos permite entregar valor y hay que tener ese sentido de comunidad que solamente se logra con ese propósito de salida, gestionándolo como una sola realidad. Eh, este es el bien común interno eh, que generamos en la empresa, hay que tenerlo en perspectiva de bien común externo hacia el bien común 
estas son las causas, estos son los efectos y el reto es poner para cada empresa lo que esto significa, qué retos tengo en cada perspectiva, cómo actualizo la dignidad de la persona, cómo soy solidario y subsidiario, cómo utilizo parte de la riqueza para cumplir estos propósitos. Al final sabemos que el único propósito, eh, la única estrategia tiene que ver con salvarnos, con ver a Dios un día cara a cara, de tal suerte que Creemos también que en la Escritura hay una lógica de causa y de efecto. Jesucristo nos dijo muchas cosas, muchas veces, si ustedes actúan de esta manera, sucederá esto, eh, de manera que también hay una lógica ahí. Termino. Las personas fueron creadas para ser amadas y las cosas fueron creadas para ser usadas. La razón por la que el mundo está en caos es porque las cosas están eh, siendo amadas y las personas están siendo usadas. La vocación del líder empresarial es para revertir esta realidad y poner a la persona en el centro. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. We see in this, in this um, presentation the importance of the economic model and the management model which is behind our concrete action. So how do we reorient our, also in business schools, our teaching and our focus? And we are happy to hear the next uh, speaker. Uh, in a later, he's an uh, arbitrator, I guess. You have a lot to do with the dilemmas also yes. so they're happy to hear you you can do it from there or here as you like i follow the spanish okay. <laughs> <laughs> the mexican <laughs> what would you do would you go there no no, no. you can stay there <laughs> okay so we stay here <laughs> My epiphany, the core of Christian ethics is love, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Em abril de 2009, li esta frase, o centro vital da ética cristã é o amor. Fiquei perturbado. <coughs> Nunca tinha ouvido falar de ética à luz do amor. Pensei que se o centro vital da conduta de um líder empresarial cristão é a ética. E se o centro vital da ética cristã é o amor, então o critério de liderança e de gestão empresarial de um cristão só podia ser o amor. It remained to me to understand how, not to ask if. Percebi depois que eu, como cristão, não tinha a liberdade de decidir se seria assim ou não. Apenas tinha a tarefa de tentar perceber como seria assim. Mandamento significa ordem, significa ordenar, pôr por ordem. Ora, o mandamento do amor é o primeiro dos mandamentos. Logo, tudo se há de ordenar segundo eu. Se tudo se deve ordenar segundo o amor, também a ética dos negócios se deve ordenar pelo mandamento do amor. Se Deus quis assim, como compreender a harmonia entre amor e negócios? Love as a management criterion means treating others as we would like to be treated if we were in their place. Um passo essencial para encontrar a harmonia entre amor e negócios foi compreender que o amor como critério de liderança empresarial não significa um distúrbio sentimental na gestão das empresas. Não. No Evangelho, Cristo deu-nos a medida, o critério, até a definição. Ama o outro como a ti mesmo. Cristo disse amor, não usou outra palavra e deu-nos a medida do amor. Nós, colocados no lugar do nosso próximo. Amor como critério de gestão significa assim tratarmos os outros, todos os nossos stakeholders, dos acionistas aos empregados, dos clientes aos fornecedores, da comunidade às futuras gerações, como se estivéssemos no lugar deles, com informação disponível. O amor assim entendido é um critério racional de gestão e é sem comparação possível o critério de liderança mais inspirador. Using the word love 
in the business world makes all the difference. Finalmente, a palavra amor não aparece confrontada com o mundo dos negócios, ou raramente aparece. E, todavia, foi a palavra usada por Cristo. O amor surge noutras palavras. Caridade, verdade, bem comum, solidariedade, virtude, dignidade da pessoa humana, liderança responsável, serviço, bondade, responsabilidade social. Todos estes conceitos são de extrema grandeza e significado, mas nenhum deles nos desassossega e compromete na gestão empresarial como a palavra amor nos desassossega e compromete. Assumir a palavra amor na liderança empresarial faz toda a diferença. Concluí que era mais fácil para mim dizer a palavra Cristo na empresa do que dizer a palavra amor. A razão tornou-se-me evidente. Cristo ainda era alguém que não eu. Um terceiro. Ao dizer amor, sou eu. Exponho-me totalmente diante dos outros. Amor é a palavra que interpela. É a palavra que nos pega fogo. É a palavra que destrói as nossas autodefesas. É a palavra que nos deixa minoritários ou sós e não, como todas as outras palavras, que nos deixam aceites ou consensuais. É, portanto, concluí a palavra que Cristo usou e nos pede que usemos para o tornar presente no mundo dos negócios. Obrigado. Thank you very much, Antonio. Very uh, challenging your last remark. And uh, yes, rather refer to Christ than to love. But uh, at the same time, you published a book on love in economy, in business, huh? if I'm correct. Uh, show it uh, because we can make promotion for love. <laughs> uh, um, and I think uh, it's one word that we heard now during this uh, conference several times, love as our ultimate value or principle, but how to translate it into reality. That's the tough, the tough uh, job we will discuss afterwards. We have uh, Stephen Young is on the program, but he could not make it. He's uh, from um, a co-initiative, a co-roundtable. Um, uh, so we gain some time uh, for us. Um, the co-initiative uh, and co-roundtable is, of course, very important also in all these processes of values-driven um, entrepreneurship. We come to Etienne um, uh, Levito uh, from France, former president of UNIAPAC, well known in the circle. No, <laughs> I will be afraid. Please, <laughs> <laughs> you have the floor. You can do it from there if you like. Okay. Please. So when I was younger, I thought that freedom was essential to me. It was to do what I want, when I want, according to my natural disposition, and doing for myself. When I was 23 years old, I was not happy, not at all happy. And the question was, why was I not happy? because I had everything apparently, and I looked for some advice, and after one hour of conversation with a Jesuit father, thank you to the Jesuit, came only one question, followed by a long silence. Etienne, what is for you essential, and what is secondary? For 50 years, I thought about this question, and after one serious accident and one tragedy in our family life, we realized with my wife that freedom is not to do what we want, but to do what is right. And to do what is right is to allow my will to be influenced and slowly shaped by other people's needs, other people's advice or opinions, and also obviously by the gospel trying to follow the example of Jesus. That is to say, 
meet my neighbors, and especially the poor. So at the beginning, I, we tried to do something in the collective sectors. And I was, as I was in the EDC, we launched a campaign against corruption. I participated also in the name of the UNIAPAC to the global forum fight against corruption in Den Haag and Prague. And I, I can explain to you that a young lady came to me after my speech saying, Mr. I had never imagined that it's possible to work in, the, in my business without corruption. She, she was living in Russland, Rus Russia, and uh, she could not imagine that. So we launched then initiatives in France and could have 400 projects of initiatives among our members. So it was a beginning of an activity in the collective world. Then I started to realize that business is not to do what I want, but to want what I do and to want to do. That's to say, want to do what is right, to work for the common good and all the values. We decided with our family to ground the foundation Cassiope to serve the poor all around the world. But I can tell you, it was very useful and necessary to pray and ask for grace and for achievement. Let me share with you the prayer from Ignace de Loyola. Take, O Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. You have given them to me, to you, Lord, I return it. I dispose of me according to your will, and only give me your love and your grace. That's enough for me. I ask nothing more. <coughs> so I want to share, to share with you that shared hardships and tough times in companies and also in our life can be opportunities to reshape vision and education. So we ask our son what he wants to do, and he said, I don't want to have any brother or sister in the company. I want to be the owner of all shares. Please do that. If you do that, I agree to come in the company. And we did it. The focus was focus on the person. Mm. What about the daughter? They say, can you help our husbands to create or buy a company? We did it with our holding, and they did it. And then we ask our children, are you ready? as we lost a son, that his money comes back to you and that you give it to a foundation. And they say yes, and we gave that money, they brought it in the foundation, and we could share it with, with uh, poor people. But the foundation, we have liked that this is a, a public recognized foundation <coughs> so that we private people work with the public sector. And it was agreed after five years of work. We have 12 board members, four from the family and eight experts from all around the world. And so inside this board, we have a representative of the state so that we know what happens in the public sectors. So help people learn and be inspired by them. So our principles are following. Last and take time with our children and within the company to hear, see, and collect information. The second is let go. Free body and brain. Free my body, free the body of my wife, my wife, his, her brain, so that we can decide together. Center on person and their confidence. Have a minimum of rules so that in different countries, in different cultures, we can apply our principle according to the situation. Respect all local features of the situation. Pray all what we do. Create links within the foundation with Esprit Families, the large association of all the foundation in France. Extend the network 
we organized a cruise in January with 50 managers in order to visit the programs in Vietnam and in Cambodia, act collectively against corruption, as I said, locally, uh, within the city, in the education, and have in mind always dignity and solidarity by coaching and respecting people, and for us, respecting moderation and sharing of, of, of our money and of fortune. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we come, uh, yeah, personal, impressive example. We will come back to all these contributions. We come to the last uh, contribution, Sergio Cavalieri from Brazil. Uh, happy to hear you in, in Portuguese, uh, <laughs> because it's very important to have this diversity of languages <laughs> also as a part of respecting diversity. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I will speak in Portuguese. Vou falar um pouco mais devagar para facilitar os tradutores, eu, já que eu, a, a pronúncia do português do Brasil é um pouco diferente da pronúncia do português de Portugal. E gostaria de me apresentar, eu sou, faço parte de uma empresa familiar, sou a terceira geração. A empresa foi fundada pelo meu avô e dois eh, cunhados em 1932 no Brasil. Eles começaram como uma empresa de construção pesada, como prestando serviço para o governo. É, o tempo foi passando, os filhos ingressaram nas, nas empresas. Houve uma segunda fase que o grupo se transformou num grupo industrial, até 1996. Eram fabricantes de cimento. E uma terceira fase que coincide com a entrada da terceira geração, que é a minha geração, no comando das empresas, com uma, uma estrutura de negócios bastante diversificada, com investimentos em, em várias áreas. Na área de distribuição de combustíveis, de construção, desenvolvimento urbano, eh, na área de construções metálicas, construções em aço, e também na área de tecnologia da informação, com o data center, que é o cloud computing. Uh, cerca de três meses atrás, nós vendemos o nosso maior negócio, que era justamente a distribuição de combustíveis. Estamos agora no momento de decisão do qual será a próxima fase da história da família. É, é uma, um momento de reflexão e de escolha de novos negócios e também uma, uma oportunidade para os sócios permanecerem, ou talvez alguns preferirem eh, se retirar. Mas o que nos levou a chegar eh, 86 anos depois da nossa fundação, passando por tantos eh, acontecimentos no Brasil, um país cheio de altos e baixos, eh, crises econômicas, financeiras, mudanças de governo, períodos de, de ditadura, períodos de governo populista de esquerda, agora um governo um novo governo populista de direita, que começará em 2019, é, o que nos levou a permanecer vivos ao longo de todo esse tempo. Nós acreditamos e confiamos é, com toda a convicção que foram os respe o respeito aos valores. E esses valores vieram antes de 1932, antes da fundação do grupo. É, a minha bisavó é, inspirou para que os três, que eram cunhados, casados com o meu avô, duas irmãs e os seus maridos, que eram três engenheiros, a trabalharem juntos. Então o grupo começou pela inspiração de uma mulher, uma mulher muito decidida, é, com princípios religiosos, de, da fé católica, é, com uma disciplina muito forte, com o valor do trabalho, o trabalho como um valor muito importante para a família. E isso migrou naturalmente para as empresas e foi passando de geração em geração, e eu diria que o principal valor é o respeito pelas pessoas, que talvez possamos é, falar em amor pelas pessoas. É, nós realmente gostamos de estar conectados com as pessoas, gostamos de estar perto das pessoas, 
gostamos de celebrar com as pessoas, é, gostamos de compartilhar momentos alegres e momentos tristes e temos é, como um feedback é, pessoas que trabalharam conosco em empresas que já vendemos há muitos anos atrás e até hoje querem reunir-se conosco, querem estar conosco, querem falar a respeito das suas vidas é, e sentem-se bem realmente numa comunidade de trabalho. É, não existe essa diferença entre o chefe, o, o patrão, o empregado. Realmente há uma proximidade muito grande entre as pessoas. É, e o que eu gostaria de deixar como é, uma recomendação muito forte, que os valores cristãos é a, são as, é a, é a ferramenta, né, são as ferramentas mais poderosas que nós temos para administrar uma empresa. Eu já frequentei muitos cursos de gestão, de liderança, de recursos humanos, de governança, de qualidade. E quando a gente pega uma série de alternativas e caminhos, é, professores, é, academias que colocam novas, é, novos caminhos, criam novas situações, é, cada vez mais eu me convenço que o caminho para o sucesso das empresas, o sucesso permanente, sustentável, são os valores cristãos. Então, usem os valores em abundância, não economizem os valores, porque eles são realmente o caminho para o sucesso, o sucesso permanente dos nossos negócios. E gostaria de deixar mais dois recados, essa era o primeiro, a primeira mensagem que eu gostaria de deixar, a respeito da nossa convicção e a nossa experiência, não só da nosso grupo, mas vejo várias empresas ao redor, que aplicam valores eh, e que são bem-sucedidas. E vemos também no Brasil, agora recentemente, empresas que deixaram de lado os valores. Eram empresas muito boas, talvez como a empresa da Inglaterra, a Carrillon, que era uma empresa muito boa, de construção também, e que se envolveu em sérios problemas, no caso do Brasil, empresas, as maiores empresas do Brasil que se envolveram em casos de corrupção. Eram empresas boas, de boas famílias, mas que não resistiram à tentação do poder e do dinheiro, juntamente com políticos que se aproveitaram dos seus cargos eh, com o poder que tinham. Outros dois recados que eu gostaria de deixar, comentários que eu reputo importantes, eh, mudanças importantes eh, recentes eh, em que vemos na, nessa questão de toda a evolução da responsabilidade das empresas. É, primeiro, quando houve a mudança da, do shareholder, como o único stakeholder principal, para os stakeholders. É, isso foi uma quebra de paradigma, é, uma mudança muito importante, e que a princípio saímos do shareholder para stakeholders, stakeholders convencionais, que eram os colaboradores, os fornecedores, os clientes, o governo, os concorrentes, e isso foi evoluindo. E chegamos hoje na situação da seguinte resposta à pergunta. Quem é o stakeholder da sua empresa? O stakeholder da sua empresa é a sociedade. E quando nós falamos disso, estamos falando do bem comum. Qualquer pessoa que se relacione com a sua empresa pode influenciar o seu negócio, para o bem ou para o mal. E por que essa mudança tão grande? porque nós estamos numa mudança de tecnologia, numa mudança de era, onde tudo é transparente, onde tudo pode ser observado, onde tudo pode ser analisado por qualquer pessoa. Então, essa mudança é uma mudança muito importante. O nosso stakeholder é a sociedade. E nós temos que nos mover na direção do bem comum para atender toda essa sociedade. E para Half finalizar... Half a minute left. Half a minute left. Ok. E para finalizar... É... Gostaria de falar também, ontem citamos, o professor Zamanhi falou aqui a respeito do, da responsabilidade civil das empresas. E estou totalmente convencido, nas últimas eleições no Brasil, agora, em 2018, do quarto pilar. O triple bottom line não funciona mais, né, econômico, o social e o ecológico. Precisamos agora do político. Precisamos, como empresários, nos envolver também nas questões políticas para ajudar as sociedades. Quando os governos não funcionam bem, isso é um desastre para os países. Temos exemplos 
bastante recentes na América Latina, como a Venezuela, que um governo, um mau governo, unido a uma sociedade que se deixou é, envolver por esse governo, e principalmente empresários e o próprio as Forças Armadas, e isso Thank trouxe you. um grande desastre para a sociedade. Então, o quarto pilar, nós temos que nos envolver nas questões políticas nas nossas sociedades. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Uh, you opened uh, an important additional dimension with the last remark on uh, the political responsibility of entrepreneurs. I think that's uh, an issue in most of our countries. How can we not only look inside and the values inside a company, but the values in society and how to help that the society as a whole, including international relations, uh, reflect these values of love and justice and fairness and freedom as were mentioned. First of all, I would like, before we open the, the next round uh, of interaction, uh, I'd like to apologize also that we are a male club here, <laughs> between 60 and 70, most of us. So, um, no, it's a serious issue because, of course, we had heard very important statements from also female participants on the panel. I was recently with Michael Miller, the Secretary General of the UN in Geneva, the number two in the UN hierarchy. And uh, he told me, I invited him for a panel, he said, I come under that one condition that 50% are, are female. I refuse from now <laughs> to come to any panel which has not this gender balance. <laughs> that was interesting, the UN uh, number two. In, um, yes, now the issue of values-driven entrepreneurship um, is tough. As we have heard from you, you all try on your way, in your way, uh, to in, in embed values and live values in an impressive way. But uh, let's look at some tough dilemmas. Um, you have, several of you have mentioned uh, corruption, for example. You can be uh, corruption-free within your company, but what do you do if your competitors are corrupt? Um, I mentioned, um, I'm uh, as a professor of ethics also teaching in China, and we are training also Christian entrepreneurs in China. Uh, we translated also one of your books into Chinese and uh, some of my books. And recently I was in a training with uh, 50 Christian entrepreneurs in China. And they asked me to do a one-day training on corruption. And I started with two questions. Who of you thinks that um, a, a Christian should be corruption-free? Of course, everybody raised their hand. Mm -hmm. The second question was, who of you thinks that you can do business in China without corruption? Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> then I said, look, that's the dilemma. Now let's look at dilemmas. And we went into details, cases, and the outcome is a book that we publish uh, soon with the title, The Better Sinner. Is there something like a <laughs> compromise? The better sinner, eh? we are still sinners, but we can deal with it. What is your, you have all your values, very important values, how to deal with this dilemma? Let's say some of you may do business with China, with Africa, with Europe, any country is affected by this issue. What is your take? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it's very difficult as we worked uh, by the ADC during four years on this subject. We know that it is very difficult to explain what is corruption so that we came to very simple laws. First one is look at corruption if you trade with corruption, you buy the conscience of the others, you destroy the economy, and you destroy the democracy. Are you okay with that? Do you understand? Okay. Now, second question. Is it corruption to, to have to receive a bunch of flowers? To receive a bunch of flowers. Yeah. Is it corruption? When is corruption beginning? That was the second question. And we said, in by the EDC, corruption begins when you cannot explain to others which kind of present you got and for what. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. It is very simple, but it took four years because when we explained to many people, they said, oh, okay, everybody's corrupted and I have to. So we had to compete against that and that's the reason why I explained this example in Russia. So with these uh, two uh, guidelines, you uh, could say we can do it without corruption in this understanding. Uh, bem, uh, nós aprendemos agora recentemente no Brasil, uh, pelo que pôde estar sendo apurado ainda, o maior esquema sistêmico mundial de corrupção que foi estabelecido no Brasil e uh, que está sendo combatido agora. E isso trouxe consequências, como o Etienne falou, né? as contas públicas destruídas, um governo que tomou conta de eh, cresceu muito, despesas muito grandes. Então ficamos com o governo quebrado, as empresas quebradas e as famílias quebradas, todos endividados. E o país então parou, cresce, entrou em, em depressão, um crescimento negativo e uma grande crise, a maior crise que o país já teve eh, em toda a sua história. Temos hoje cerca de 13 milhões de desempregados no Brasil. É, e um crescimento agora retomando um crescimento mas muito lento e isso motivado por justamente por essa por dois aspectos a omissão nossa omissão da sociedade das pessoas que têm mais responsabilidade mais conhecimento vamos falar aqui especificamente dos empresários ou então o conluio com o governo corrupto em, empresas que também se corromperam é, as pessoas a sociedade acordou percebeu que isso foi um exemplo um, uma uma tragédia para o país, uma, um impacto muito grande para o país. E nas últimas eleições, por um processo democrático, respeitando a Constituição, houve um câmbio, uma mudança muito grande nos, no, no sistema político, na, na, nas eleições, naqueles políticos tradicionais não foram eleitos. E, felizmente, um grupo de juízes e procuradores estão colocando na cadeia as pessoas mais importantes, os empresários mais influentes na sociedade. Então, nós, o governo, a, a sociedade acordou, os empresários acordaram e viram que esse não é um caminho. Hum. E nós esperamos que daqui para frente isso não se repita, mas a sociedade já está alerta. Se daqui a quatro anos, como temos novas eleições, se os atuais políticos não performarem bem, serão tirados dos seus, das suas posições. E é muito importante esse combate à corrupção através de grupos de associações, como o EDC, Uniapac, as Uniapacs locais, eh, associações comerciais, de indústria, porque isoladamente é muito difícil conseguir uma única empresa conseguir combater a corrupção. E obrigado, Etienne, pelas dicas <laughs> de, da classificação do que é corrupção. It was also your job. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this kind of not individual fighters, but uh, of uh, a community which helps each other to, uh, to overcome and uh, be on the line of values implementation. Thank you, that's an important part. Richard, you wanted to add to the same? I'd like to give an example actually from um, China. I have visited mainland China several times, but even more so Hong Kong. And I do know um, a notable toy manufacturer who's based in Hong Kong, but his factories are in the south of China. He's a man I greatly respect, and he claims never to have paid any bribes in China. Um, I believe he's an honest man, uh, he's a humble man, um, and I can believe that his company has now established such a reputation that the authorities think there's no point in asking him for bribes and they appreciate and value the work that he and his company are doing. What I think is much more difficult is for the, um, um, the, 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 the small company as it's making its way in the world. You know, before it has um, secured that reputation, to get to that position of respect without paying any bribes on the way, I think is a very demanding challenge. And I'm not quite sure how the gentleman that I have in mind managed to do it. But anyway, he assures me <laughs> that he did. <laughs> so I just thought I'd share that uh, experience, which is interesting. Thank you, that's an important part. Uh, the, the bigger the company, that's also my uh, uh, experience, I say it as a participant, not as a moderator, mm. is that uh, 
the small companies are those who suffer most, the SMEs, mm -hmm. whereas the big companies, they have their standards and they also have their purchasing uh, power, so to say, and negotiating power more than, mm -hmm. than the small ones. Uh, leading uh, back to the... May I say also that I, my company is a small, middle-sized company. Okay. Yep. We worked a lot with China. I refused all the time any bribery. I had a very difficult situation to survive. Mm -hmm. I was in danger, but I said no. I prevent my wife that I will say no. It was dangerous to do it, but I did. Mm. It's possible. Well done. Mm. Exactly. Um, Antonio, the, this example of, of this British company, um, under uh, cutting the, the, the market prices in order to get the, the deal, but then being uh, uh, collapse at, at the end. What is your advice? I mean, a love uh, economy. How would you deal <coughs> if I, you are the, the owner of this company? How would you deal with it? You have the, the pressure from the market. Uh, you, you may not get the deal if you are not undergoing the, the competitors. Vou falar português porque sou mais breve. Um, não me procuro a palavra. Um, vamos lá ver. Eu sou advogado. Eu trabalho com leis e trabalho com uma lei extraordinária, que é o Código Civil, além das outras todas. E, se, e muitas vezes me deparo com esta realidade que é, nas leis está quase tudo o que devemos fazer. E, portanto, se cumprimos as leis, em princípio estamos bem. O que separa o cristão do Código Civil é o que separa o Código Civil do Evangelho. É este fosso, é esta diferença que torna as coisas diferentes. O problema, quando foi a crise de 2008, houve um grande debate aqui na Católica, na Universidade, sobre se de facto havia um problema moral associado ao comportamento dos líderes das instituições financeiras porque, em rigor, muitos deles não tinham violado nenhuma regra legal. E, portanto, não tendo uh, violado regras legais, não havia violação de, de princípios éticos. Ora, isso não era verdade, porque é irresponsável conduzir uma empresa, primeiro de uma forma desleal para esse stakeholder essencial, que é preciso amar, que são os nossos concorrentes, e é preciso amar, e o amor permite ver isso, porque estão milhares de pessoas, de vidas humanas, de famílias, ligadas aos nossos concorrentes e que esperam a nossa lealdade, e ao mesmo tempo há uma irresponsabilidade de conduzir uma empresa que a certa altura, por ganância e naquela esperança de não ser descoberto, como todos os ladrões, todos os ladrões esperam quando invadem as nossas casas à noite, vão ser descobertos, não é? E, esse, e quem gera as empresas assim é totalmente irresponsável, é uma quebra total do amor que se deve ter pela nossa própria empresa, pelos nossos próprios, pela nossa própria dignidade pessoal. Portanto, este exemplo que foi dado, por mim, é, 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 é paradigmático. Deixem-me só dizer o seguinte. Eu, eu não gosto de ser, e muito menos, vindo daqui falar de amor, pronto, alguém fez de senhor aqui, não é? O, mas o, o falar de ser mal entendido, porque eu também eu gosto de ser pragmático, muito pragmático. Vamos lá ver. A minha firma é uma firma, é uma leading firm portuguesa, tem 300 advogados, estava espalhada pelo mundo. Para nós é impensável, impensável, entrar em qualquer esquema de corrupção. Quando fizemos os nossos investimentos e parcerias, por exemplo, em Angola, que é um país que está no radar de, de internacional quanto à corrupção, foi para nós claro, se for necessário fazer, íamos embora. E realmente não é necessário fazer, pelo contrário. É muita gente angolana que nos agradece que assim não seja. Há outros que o façam. Perdemos talento, é verdade. Perdemos clientes, é verdade. Mas aquele é o nosso paradigma de negócio. Mas onde eu quero chegar é que num país pobre, ou que está a sair de uma guerra civil tão difícil como Angola, que é um país que está no coração dos portugueses, ainda está cá o Presidente da República de Angola e todos nós temos essa emoção de o sentir cá e de sentir Angola cá, eu não quero ser moralista ao ponto de dizer que é tudo igual a pequena corrupção que às vezes há em Portugal ou nestes, nos países europeus é pequena ou grande do que se passa nestes países pobres e nestas culturas em que a corrupção se tornou endémica eu não o faço, mas eu não tenho o mesmo juízo de valor 
não, faço, não tenho a mesma agressividade de repulsa nestes países, porque estes países precisam. Não sei se daqui a 40 ou 50 anos, muitos empresários que começaram por fazer corrupção contra gosto, contra gosto, violentassem a sua consciência nesses países, alguns que eu conheço para proteger centenas de, ou milhares de postos de trabalho, se um dia destes, quando estes países derem a volta, se tornarem países do, 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 do grande mundo, esses não serão heróis, até pelo sacrifício moral que tiveram que passar. Grave é não passarem pelo sacrifício moral. Grave, grave é a corrupção se tornar também peça intrínseca a eles próprios. Isso é tão é horrível. Mas pronto. Thank, thank you very much. That's a very important point, the relation between values and law, where the legal system, the judiciary, is key to implement the values that we want to leave in the companies. And if the judiciary is not helping, what do we do? A uh, question to you, uh, Alejandro, in Mexico. I was uh, some years ago invited to give a training to the Supreme Court of uh, Tabasco State. Mm because they had a new code of ethics and uh, they said now we how to implement this code in the judiciary because we knew that uh, they, they had also some challenges in, uh, in the uh, judiciary. So how do you do it if uh, you feel that the judiciary <coughs> may not uh, stick to the, to the values that the company has, but if the judiciary is not supporting these values, what do you do? Lo haré también en español. Eh, yo creo que está muy de moda en las organizaciones estos eh, decálogos de valores y yo creo que está muy bien que uno se atreva a poner por escrito los compromisos que tiene de cara a las interacciones con sus stakeholders. Eh, pero sabemos que los códigos son cosas que si no tienen un acicate, eh, pues no se cumplen. Eh, la ley nos obliga eh, a cumplir los códigos eh, civiles, pero no nos obliga a cumplir los decálogos que nosotros eh, promovemos. Entonces, eh, en México ciertamente tenemos un problema eh, de, de corrupción. Eh, hay muchas instituciones que están queriendo eh, salir de este problema, pero lo que nos, lo que nos hemos dado cuenta es que eh, tenemos que organizarnos, lo, lo mismo que comentaba Sergio, tenemos que organizarnos desde la sociedad civil para ser nosotros los que empujemos y que hagamos que se cumpla, porque eh, en la, la corrupción está ligada a otro gran problema, que es la impunidad. Si la gente sabe que puede salir impune de eh, un delito que comete, pues se juega la probabilidad de, eh, digamos, si no está inspirado por, por principios este, trascendentes, se juega la posibilidad de incumplir la ley porque sabe que la posibilidad de salir impune es del 98%. Esa es la estadística que, que tenemos en nuestro país, por desgracia. Entonces, eh, nos parece bien que, que, que las instituciones de justicia emitan eh, este tipo de códigos, pero creo que falta un acicate, eh, la, so la ciudadanía por un lado asegurándose de que eso se cumpla y por supuesto eh, la, la ley, eh, digamos, eh, la gente encargada de ejercer la justicia buscando que se castigue al que incumple la ley. Y, y también estamos trabajando desde la sociedad civil en ese punto. Tenemos una iniciativa de los organismos empresariales que se llama una fiscalía que sirva justamente para que la impunidad vaya bajando y para que eh, cada vez más empresas se comprometan con eh, estos principios, estos valores. Mm, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, just one uh, information. We uh, have another 10 minutes because we started a bit late. Uh, the God there in the dark uh, gave us another 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one and two and then, uh, yeah, yes. Just an example to say what we did in our company uh, regarding corruption. Mm. As we knew, about corruption because or the minister of justice told me her here please there is everywhere corruption so please don't insist too much it is corruption i know about that so what we did in our company as we saw that our buyer received a handbag from hermes people told me look there is a bag there what can we do From this time on, we ask that all the prisons from all the people will be shared at the end of the year. And so we had a lot of prisons but to share. But I can tell you, four years later, we had no prison anymore. <laughs> 
Encouraging example of values driven, yes. <laughs> eu, eu acho que é importante esse momento que estamos é, falando de a nobre vocação do líder empresarial e começamos aqui uma discussão sobre corrupção. Mas, na realidade, no dia a dia, encontramos muito mais do que corrupção. Né? Então, são os problemas dos impostos, que são sonegados, é, a forma que tratamos os nossos funcionários, aí condições é, desumanas de trabalho, muitas vezes, ou salários muito baixos, é, a questão da qualidade de produtos, qualidades inferiores ao que está sendo é, feito a publicidade. Então, são vários, várias tentações, várias no mundo real, no mundo da competição, da mesma forma que a, a inteligência humana trabalha no sentido de fazer coisas boas, trabalha também no sentido de encontrar muitos, muitos atalhos, é, muitas coisas erradas para conseguir lucrar mais. É, então, se estamos falando da nobre vocação, temos que olhar todos esses problemas, esses dilemas, essas decisões que temos que tomar no dia a dia, nos inspirarmos dentro dos valores, seguindo os valores, nos reunirmos como sociedade, é, termos essa participação, a coragem de nos apresentarmos contra as, os, as coisas erradas, as, as, as decisões erradas dos nossos próprios colegas e nos posicionarmos como uma decisão firme de queremos construir empresas melhores, uma sociedade melhor, um mundo melhor. Se a sociedade, uhum. se aquele conjunto de empresários não tiverem esse desejo, não vamos mudar o estado de coisas. Então, muito mais do que a lei, muito mais do que a, as, as leis são importantes, mas não são suficientes. Né? É preciso toda a questão da, 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 dos valores, uh, toda a questão da consciência, da moral de cada um, para juntos conseguirmos construir essa nova, é, um novo comportamento, uma nova atitude dos empresários. Uhum. E para que a sociedade nos veja como os solucionadores de problemas. Nós não somos os que criamos problemas para a sociedade. As empresas, o trabalho é a solução da sociedade. Se queremos tirar, resgatar pessoas da pobreza, é através do trabalho, é através do empreendimento, através do empreendedorismo. Então, isso precisamos fortalecer, porque muitos países ainda vêm, muitos governos ainda vêm um empresário como aquele que explora a sociedade, como aquele que quer somente obter lucro. E essa imagem temos que mudar, porque nós não somos isso. Isso é uma minoria que atua dessa forma. A grande maioria quer o bem, quer construir empresas duradouras, bem-sucedidas, mas que estão fazendo bem para a sociedade. Então, esse grupo que nós precisamos reunir, que é a maioria, e ficar mais fortes e influenciar mais no mundo dos negócios. Obrigado muito. Deixe-me chegar para o último round, para os últimos minutos, com uma outra pergunta topic which is uh, in the air, that is the whole cyber world and the uh, industrial revolution which we call the 4.0. I published a week ago a book on cyber ethics uh, 4.0 with 25 articles and when we see the, the, these disruptive technologies as it was called already today, a short question, do you think now in your business you can stick to the values that you have also for these new challenges or you have to modify because we are in a new world uh, a singularity university is telling that we are moving to a new value system or can we say no uh, we stick to our christian values as they are with since 2000 years with us just very brief a uh, few seconds 30 okay. seconds Okay. So, um, Richard, start. Well, for me, the the big challenge, I think, of the whole internet world is is the increasing monopolization of power by a few um, big companies, and um, we all know who they are: um, Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, and so on, which just seem to be um, consuming, eating up all the other companies in their areas. And, and some, I mean, Amazon, for instance, not content with taking over the book trade, they seem to be getting into uh, all other sorts of retail as well. So there's some huge ethical questions there, I think, about um, monopoly, which really need to be tackled on an international scale. But whether there's a will to do that, I'm not sure, because these companies actually often provide very good um, service in terms of what the customer receives. But the um, principle of the 
former values that yeah. you have I think, are still valid? I think the values are still, are still right, but it's, it's a challenge now knowing how best to apply them in the present climate. Thank you very much. Mm. Eh, sin duda, la, la doctrina social, eh, una vez sistematizada, es un mecanismo sobre la interacción humana formidable. Eh, la iglesia es maestra de humanidad. Eh, ¿Por qué es iglesia? Y porque tiene dos mil años observando el comportamiento humano. Eh, es maestra de humanidad porque sabe qué pasa en la interacción humana. Entonces yo creo que esos principios siguen estando vigentes, pero es muy difícil que esos principios tengan, eh, digamos, eh, una, una validez en el día a día si es que uno no tiene un sentido trascendente de la vida. Me parece que el gran reto hoy en día es justo retomar ese sentido trascendente, el entender como cristianos que al final estamos de paso en este mundo y todo tiene sentido si es que eh, levantamos la vista y lo vemos hacia nuestra posible salvación. Mm. Si no lo hacemos así, cualquier principio puede cambiar en la revolución 4.0 o en la 5 o en la 6. Yo creo que en la medida en la que tengas un sentido de vida trascendente, comprendamos que estamos aquí de paso, la interacción humana se podrá facilitar a través de la doctrina social, no tengo duda. Thank you very much. Antonio. Yo creo que su pregunta hace todo el sentido. Pero la respuesta cristã es decir que la pregunta para un cristão no hace cualquier sentido. Neste, nesta ótica, o mundo está no ano 2018, depois de Cristo. Bom, Cristo deve estar a olhar para hoje e a ver o mundo que ainda há de vir e pensar que isto que nós estamos agora a viver como uma revolução será, na história do homem e, portanto, na dele, com o homem, um detalhe. Um detalhe que ficará no passado. E por isso não tem sentido a pergunta, assim devemos dizer os nós cristãos, porque na ótica que eu, que eu sustento, do amor como peça central da ética e da nossa gestão e da nossa liderança, não faz qualquer sentido que o amor não, não permaneça vivo, atuante, decisivo, em qualquer cenário da humanidade, como será este, que será um cenário manifestamente novo. Já agora para os novos que aqui estão, que há aqui uns jovens, eu gostava só de terminar com isto. Vocês, hoje em dia, nós todos estamos a comunicar uns com os outros eletronicamente. Já trabalhamos em casa, já trabalhamos longe, eletronicamente. É preciso aquecer, humanizar a relação eletrónica. Há, há relações de uma secura, de uma secura que me faz aflição. E isto vai fazer um caminho que eu acho que é muito mau para, para a vivência empresarial no futuro. Mas enfim... A minha resposta é que essa pergunta temos que dizer que não faz sentido. Na nossa ótica, claro. Thank you very much, uh, Etienne Vibo. <laughs> yes, it is a disruption. You're right. You know that uh, 90% of the young people, of the children under 10 years old, have seen a, core, uh, a hardcore film. It is a disruption. It was not before. So what we have done, I am in the board of a journalist school, we decided to set up the opposite. A school who is showing in film the common good, the good, the beautiful, the nice, and learn to the children to exchange this kind of film instead of the others. Great answer, thank you so much, Sergio Cavalieri. Bem, eu acredito é, que as mudanças são permanentes e quando eu sou convidado a falar e dar alguma, alguma uh, palestra, algum aconselhamento, as mudanças são permanentes. A, a vida inteira a humanidade vive de mudanças, agora mais acelerado e mais intensas. Tudo muda, tudo se altera, mas para mim os valores são realmente permanentes. Então eu acredito que... Por isso eu digo que a ferramenta mais poderosa da gestão são os valores, porque esses são permanentes e podemos usar hoje, da, daqui a um século, dois séculos, três séculos, esses valores serão válidos durante toda a vida. Thank you very much for this summary. Listening to this uh, distinguished panel, uh, I think we feel that all of you, all of us, feel that we have to stick to the values. We can stick to the values, even though in concrete decisions it's not easy. 
we have uh, to, to be creative, to find solutions, but uh, it's an impressive round of commitment. Yes, we can, eh? yeah. somehow. <laughs> and um, I think that unites us in this um, UNIAPAC uh, great uh, conference. And um, these values of love, of freedom to the right, uh, to do the right, and of responsibility to take risks, but in a, in a measured way, uh, to let things go, but also to keep uh, it in hand where needed, to be moderate, solidarity, and uh, all the other values that were mentioned. Uh, if you allow, I'd like to, to close with a short announcement of two things. One is um, this Geneva Agape Foundation, where I'm the director. Uh, we organize in, uh, on 20 and 21st of January a conference in Geneva on Spirituality 4.0, how to live spirituality as entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, we are honored that the Rolanda and others among you will be present there uh, to, to, to look together into what are the spiritual sources that is sourcing us in our commitment to values. Uh, you will find uh, flyers outside. And also um, in this foundation, we did a directory of 100 30 organizations, UNIAPAC of course the largest and uh, most famous, but there are other from different denominations and then we enlarge it even for interfaith, so Jewish entrepreneurs associations, Hindu entrepreneurs associations, in order to see what are common values. If you are dealing with different uh, countries, we have Buddhists in, in Thailand and we deal with the Buddhist entrepreneurs and Confucian entrepreneurs in China. So how can we find common ground across uh, nations and value systems? And uh, this you can uh, access. Uh, I have a few copies of this directory, but you can also, it's a searchable database on GA Foundation for Geneva, Agape Foundation, GA Foundation dot world. And then you can search, for example, by your country, what other entrepreneurs associations are active in your country in order to create synergies. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, uh, now is a break if I'm correct. Thank you. <laughs>